Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. We begin with the latest developments on the war in the Middle East. Fighting between Israel and Hamas rages on in Gaza's second largest city. This as U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres dramatically escalates his call for a ceasefire. Guterres has written to the U.N. Security Council over the issue, invoking a rarely used power. Here's his spokesman, Stefan Dujaric. In the letter which has been shared with you, the Secretary General urges the members of the Security Council to press to avert a humanitarian catastrophe, and he appeals for a humanitarian ceasefire to be declared. This is the first time a U.N. Secretary General has used this power since the 1970s. Meanwhile, Nathan, there is more fallout from the Capitol Hill testimony of three university presidents. Hedge fund titans, politicians, and business leaders are railing against the leaders of Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania for refusing to say the calling for the genocide of Jews is against school policy. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports. Pfizer CEO Albert Burlo took to X, formerly Twitter, to say he was ashamed to hear the university president's testimony, calling it one of the most despicable moments in the history of U.S. academia. Investor Bill Ackman, who called on his alma mater, Harvard, to do more to protect Jewish students, posted on X, quote, they all must resign in disgrace. Penn President Liz McGill issued a video statement to clarify her testimony. For decades, under multiple Penn presidents and consistent with most universities, Penn's policies have been guided by the Constitution and the law. In today's world, where we are seeing signs of hate proliferating across our campus and our world, these policies need to be clarified and evaluated. Harvard President Dr. Claudine Gay issued a statement clarifying the university has a staunch position against calls for violence against the Jewish community. But critics say she should have said that while she was on Capitol Hill. Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Okay, Amy, thank you. There are new developments this morning in the war in Ukraine. From here in the U.S., the Senate has failed to get the votes to try to pass aid for the country. And Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has the latest. It's back to the drawing board, not even making it for a floor vote with the issue border funding for the GOP. President Biden says they have to get something done. This cannot wait. Congress needs to pass supplemental funding for Ukraine before they break for the holiday resources. It's as simple as that. Frankly, I think it's stunning that we've gotten to this point in the first place. Now, the U.S. has shipped more aid to Ukraine, but says it could be the last without more funding. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Ed, thank you. Now let's get to the latest in the presidential race. The fourth Republican debate was held last night in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And with frontrunner Donald Trump off the stage, the remaining candidates train much of their fire on Nikki Haley, who's been gaining in the polls. Vivek Ramaswamy went after the former U.N. ambassador over her ties to Wall Street. Larry Fink, the king of the woke industrial complex, the ESG movement, the CEO of BlackRock, the most powerful company in the world, now supporting Nikki Haley. And to say that doesn't affect her is false. And Haley defended her record. Look, we will take support from anybody we can take support from. But I have been a conservative fighter all my life. Along with Haley and Ramaswamy, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie also took part in the debate hosted by News Nation. The first votes in this race will be cast in Iowa in less than six weeks. Turning back to Wall Street, Karen, leaders of the nation's biggest banks appeared on Capitol Hill for the Senate Banking Committee's annual Wall Street oversight hearing. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon told lawmakers he would shutter the crypto industry if he had their power. I've always been deeply opposed to crypto, Bitcoin, etc. You pointed out the only true use case for it is criminals, drug traffickers, anti-money laundering, tax avoidance. And that is a use case. If I was the government, I'd close it down. Jamie Dimon's remarks add to his long history of bashing digital currencies. He's previously called them Ponzi schemes and a fraud. Well, Nathan, the valuation for Elon Musk's SpaceX blasts into orbit, and we get the details from Bloomberg's John Tucker. John. And Karen, a share sale for SpaceX would value the company at at least $175 billion. SpaceX is considering offering shares at about $95 apiece. The potential valuation would position SpaceX among the world's most valuable companies, surpassing Comcast and Disney. It's number one in the space race. In the first nine months of the year, SpaceX made 69 orbital launches. 
Well, SpaceX is on track to book revenues of about $9 billion this year, with sales projected to rise to around $15 billion next year. John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. Thanks, John. Turning overseas, China and EU officials are holding their first in-person summit in four years in Beijing. And we get more from Bloomberg's Jill Desis in Taiwan. What they ultimately talked about was really sort of strengthening this idea of the trade partnership. We've gotten a readout from a state media in China saying that she was really emphasizing this idea of China being willing to be a key trade and economic partner for the EU. They were talking about the need to work on political trust, this idea of mutually beneficial cooperation. Bloomberg's Jill Disa says the meeting lasted only one day. And Nathan, the European Union is nearing a deal on what's poised to become the most comprehensive regulation of artificial intelligence in the Western world. Negotiators are still hammering out the final details, but sources say delegates agreed to a set of controls for generative artificial intelligence tools, such as OpenAI's ChatGPT and Google's BARD. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Amy Morris. Amy, good morning. Good morning, Karen. More than 600 mass shootings in the U.S. so far this year. 2023 now on pace to be a record year for gun violence. And three people are dead in the shooting at UNLV. Sheriff Kevin McHill of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police said that shooting originated on the fourth floor of a building on campus. And the unnamed suspect was killed by an officer at the scene. If it hadn't been for the her- Heroic actions of one of those police officers who responded. There could have been countless additional lives taken. Police say they know the identity of the suspect. They're not releasing his name until after they notify next of kin. Survivors of gun violence, victims' families, and lawmakers gathered at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. for the 11th annual National Vigil for All Victims of Gun Violence. Among those speaking at the vigil, Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut. We are here heartbroken by the fact that we continue to need to assemble. But we also have to be here buoyed by the fact that this is no longer a leap of faith. We have built a movement that will sustain, that will continue to win. And we have proven that when we build that movement and when we win, we save lives. The vigil was organized by the Newtown Action Alliance Foundation and held ahead of next Thursday's anniversary of the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. On Capitol Hill, Senate Republicans are blocking a Democratic ban on assault-style weapons. Republican Senator John Barrasso blocked the motion, arguing that the bill would label responsible gun owners as criminals. Capitol Hill continues to see an exodus of lawmakers, with former Speaker Kevin McCarthy the latest to announce that he's stepping down. Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has more on the trend. Terry Haynes with Pangea Policy says, with Republicans Kevin McCarthy and Patrick McHenry announcing their departures this week, those left seem to have a particular bent. More of the firebrands, more of the people who think it's all about Team Red, Team Blue. Former Congressman and former White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney says there could be more departures coming. If you're a Republican who has a better offer right now on the table, you are seriously considering it, looking for a way to leave. Mulvaney tells Bloomberg Sound On from what he's hearing, it's a toxic atmosphere now on Capitol Hill. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio. Global news 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg, Karen. All right, Amy, thank you. We do bring you news throughout the day right here on Bloomberg Radio. But now you can get the latest news on demand. And that means whenever you want it, like Amy said. You just subscribe to Bloomberg News Now, and you can get the latest headlines at the click of a button. Get informed on your schedule. You can listen and subscribe to Bloomberg News Now on the Bloomberg Business app, Bloomberg.com, plus Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update. Here's John Stashauer. John. Karen, the Yankees suffered through an uncharacteristically down season in 2023, making sure it doesn't happen again. The day after acquiring one left-handed hitting outfielder, Alex Verdugo from Boston, they've acquired another one, and it's a big star. Juan Soto comes from San Diego with another outfielder, Trent Grisham. The Padres, in return, get pitcher Michael King, three other young pitchers, and veteran catcher Kyle Higashioka. The Yankees may have Soto for just the 2024 season. He's going to be a free agent after that. Eduardo Rodriguez, the veteran lefty, 
leaving Detroit. He signed a four-year deal with Arizona. Week 14 of the NFL begins tonight. The lowly, struggling 2-10 and Patriots in Pittsburgh. Steelers come off a bad home loss to Arizona, but they're in it for a playoff spot. Not sure if they'll have running back Najee Harris. He's questionable with a knee injury. Joel Embiid, 50 points in Philadelphia's 131-126 at Washington. That drops the Wizards to 3-17. and The Warriors are 10-11. and They trailed until the fourth quarter, but Steph Curry bailed them out, scored 31. Golden State beat Portland 110-106. to Luka Doncic played only 32 minutes, scored 40 at a triple-double by halftime. Dallas won by 50 over Utah. Cleveland beat Orlando. Donovan Mitchell, 35 points in the win. Paulo Banquero, 42 in the loss. And Desmond Bain scored 49 in Memphis's win at Detroit. John Stash Network, Bloomberg Sports. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. Well, it's taken more than a decade, but it finally looks like the first ever spot Bitcoin ETFs will arrive in the U.S. soon. On the most recent episode of the Bloomberg Trillions podcast, Bloomberg's Joel Weber and Eric Balchunas spoke with ARK Investment founder Kathy Wood. They discussed spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds, getting approval for them from the Securities and Exchange Commission, and convincing crypto doubters like J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon and Senator Elizabeth Warren. So we want to bring you part of that discussion right now. You're still having to wrestle with a version of of haters, right? And I think the haters actually for a while within the last year and change kind of gained a little bit of an upper hand with the carnage that um, came out of the um, SBF fallout. So how do you wrestle with that sentiment that still remains, which is like, there's no point to this. Why should I even bother? So I'll start there. Uh, I had to defend uh, what we were doing throughout last year. Uh, So Terra Luna, Celsius, Three Arrows, FTX. And when FTX blew up, um, I basically said, and I think it's now clear, that, wait a minute, this proves the value of uh, Bitcoin and other uh, other cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin, completely transparent, decentralized, uh, no counterparty risk, whereas FTX, completely uh, opaque, uh, centralized, and fraudulent. So that was the first step. But even more provocative, I thought, was during the regional bank crisis in March, as you pointed out earlier, uh, Joel, um, Bitcoin went up 50% as the KRE, the regional bank index, was imploding and SVB and Signature went under. And we were able to say to our clients, wait a minute, uh, Bitcoin is not just a risk on asset. It is now showing its stripes as a risk off asset when there's a financial crisis and counterparty risk becomes a question, because that was a question with the regional banks. I think that has gotten a lot of people's attention, as well as um, others in the industry who were negative. And you're right, it's so interesting to see Jamie Dimon and Elizabeth Warren on the same side of the, on the and agreeing with each other, kind of, uh, what? Uh, but someone like Larry Fink coming around after, after years of uh, focusing on the environmental issues that he thought were a part of the, the, the Bitcoin ecosystem. And you know, I think one of the most important things that happened actually happened five years ago when Cambridge Associates Associates uh, published its first report on crypto and focused on Bitcoin in particular and and basically said to its foundations and endowments, look, you may not like uh, this uh, instrument, but you, you should get to know as much as you possibly can about it because this seems like it's a new asset class with a very low correlation of returns uh, to other assets. And so I think but one by one, these points uh, are, I think, uh, are, 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 are hitting home, hitting a responsive chord. And I do think the SEC coming around and blessing uh, a Bitcoin spot ETF is going to uh, check the box for a lot of institutions. When, let's say that it 
approves. What happens to the price of of Bitcoin when that headline moves that SEC has approved a spot Bitcoin product? Some of it's happening right now. But there, that's the lead up. Is, and there's this anticipation. Yeah, this is the well, by the rumor it's all, moment it's right here. Bu- building for yeah. that moment. But what happens it, at that moment? Yeah, very often, very often, you will get a sell on the news because, and I don't know where it will go between now and then. And you could have a sell on the news and, you know, you'll get maybe some weak holders in uh, kicking and screaming and, and they may sell. But. When you think we're at roughly 19 and a half million Bitcoin outstanding, and we're only going to 21 million, uh, and I really do believe that, uh, uh, knowing the core, de- some of the core developers the way I do, uh, then I think this institutional push in uh, will be the biggest reason that our target, which uh, the base case is 650,000 and the bull case is 1.5 million. Uh, the one of the reasons uh, that we have a shot that those numbers are close to the mark is the institutional interest in a new asset class. And that was the founder of ARK Investment Management, Kathy Wood, speaking with Joel Weber and Eric Balchunas on the Bloomberg Trillions podcast. Download it on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, on the Bloomberg Business app as well. Sticking with the tech space, Advanced Micro Devices has unveiled new so-called accelerator chips that it says will be able to run artificial intelligence software faster than rival products. At a launch event in San Jose, California, AMD CEO Lisa Su sat down with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow to explain. The truth is, uh, we've all experienced over the last you know 12 months this incredible revolution, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ChatGPT has has really changed the way we think about what tech can do, and the underlying capability of that is GPUs and you know very very capable GPUs. Um, you know, we made some very very good decisions um, you know a few years ago about how to put together this technology, and that includes. Um, both being very good for training, so training large models, um, but also very good for um, answering questions or inference. So when you ask you know, the, uh, ChatGPT a question, um, it takes sometimes a little bit of time for it to respond to an answer. Some latency. There's some latency there. And um, you know, we found uh, you know, really a great technological solution by adding you know, lots of um, high bandwidth memory or memory capacity. Uh, Which and- NVIDIA will not have until H200, second quarter of next year. Uh, that is correct. We are industry leaning, uh, so you know, best in class in terms of inference performance. And um, what, what is the side by side, Lisa, on training and performance? Mi three hundred X versus H one hundred. Yeah. So if you look at, um, and we showed some of the benchmarks um, earlier today. If you look at training performance, um, we're very, very competitive. Let's call it, you know, it's it's a toss up. When you look at inference performance, uh, we're one point four to one point six times better. And you know what that means is, you know, if you're running these models, you can actually run Run more models, or you can run larger models, um, you know, with uh, MI300. And, and right now, you know, the key to AI is GPU compute. I mean, that is absolutely what everybody says. And, and so we're here to provide lots of GPU compute. You've had the confidence to dramatically alter your your forecast for this market for AI accelerators. You're saying a total addressable market of 400 billion US dollars in 2027. In August, just in August, you said it was. 150 billion. What has changed? Yeah, and you know, uh, really, the way we look at these things is we usually look at these things on an annual basis. And so, you know, when we were, you know, doing our plan for 2023 and beyond last year, uh, we thought that um, you know this year there would be about a 30 billion dollar market, and it would grow, you know, 50 percent um, compound annual growth rate. So, be about 150 billion in 2027, uh, which frankly was very, very large. Um, but what's changed is. We, we can all see what's changed, right? People need more compute. They're installing more. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers for this year are probably closer to 45 billion. And when we talk to customers, when I spend time with our partners, and um, you know, what they tell us is uh, the technology requires more compute. And so we now believe the total market for this, um, it's upwards of 400 billion in 2027. It's huge. Uh, there's no one size fits all. There are going to be multiple solutions. Um, there are lots of good solutions. Solutions um, 
um, out there today, but uh, we, we believe the AMD capability is uh, you know, very significant, and, and so we're excited about it. It was interesting to see on stage how MI300X manifests itself in the real world, but you'd already guided us that it will likely be the, the quickest AMD product to $1 billion. There were sections of the market in the street that said your forecast of $2 billion of sales for MI300X in 24 was conservative. If you're saying that the total addressable market by 2027 is now 400 billion, then is that two billion forecast for next year specifically for MI300X conservative as the market <laughs> thinks it is? Well, I think we have to take a step back and just look at how this technology is evolving. So, uh, you know, we did update in our last um, you know conference call to an expectation of about two billion in 2024 uh, for our data center GPUs. Um, it's a very early estimate. Um, I would say you know we have clear line of sight to that. Uh, but you know what people ask me is you know, like there's much more customer demand. Definitely. Definitely. And there's also um, you know, significantly more supply because we've had to prepare the supply chain so that we're ready to ramp. So we'll update as we go along. You know, we, we are um, you know, definitely on this path to ramp um, MI300 uh, the fastest as anything's ever ramped at, at AMD. And you know, I view this as a multi-year opportunity for us. I mean, supply is a key question because when you say about $2 billion, about could mean less or more than $2 billion. But what is the state of supply right now? Has it improved such that actually you could exceed your expectations because you have visibility on a greater volume of GPUs to hand over to customers? Yeah, for sure. When we plan, um, we plan for success. And so our planning has um, the capability to be significantly higher than $2 billion. Um, we have you know, customer demand, you know, sort of lots and lots of interest uh, for MI300. And I think the key for us is you know, one step at a time. Right? Today was a, a huge day in terms of the launch. Uh, we're actively in deployment with a number of the customers and partners, you know, Microsoft on stage, or Oracle, Meta, um, our OEM partners, Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro, um, everyone is um, you know, really doing just phenomenal HPE on the MI300A side. So um, a great, great set of partners and a great partnerships um, for us to ramp as, as fast as possible. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.